Welcome to another episode of Maritime Health and Performance Chat. Have I recruited my current guest for this show because of his extensive background in academia, the strength and conditioning world, and high performance sport? Or is it because Nova Scotia is in lockdown and all I have to talk to is my wife and my cat? Well, check out the rest of this episode and you can be the judge of that. My guest today is a former schoolmate of mine at UMB during our undergrad. We did a lot of our work together. I remember specifically stats. We spent a lot of time over in the Eng library because we could get a, a free version of the textbook and blast the assignments. I think it was every Friday night and we had head out for some beers after many a time. Um, but he went on to do his master's um, over in Europe, and I'll let him tell you a lot more about that. Uh, kinesiology background and exercise science. And now he's back here working in the strength conditioning world and really kind of pushing that evidence-based background, but as well as experience-based. He's worked with so many athletes as well as being a high-level university athlete himself. So now that I've rambled on about him for a while. My guest today, Pat Cormier. Pat, I'll uh, hand the mic over to you and tell everyone about yourself. Cheers, Matt. Thanks for the introduction. Definitely some good memories from uh, our undergrad together. <laughs> some stats. I know I probably couldn't have gotten through that course without you, so I, I, I thank you for that <laughs> still, I think four or five years later now, I mean, that's or even more. Blind. Yeah, it's crazy to think that we graduated in 2017. I know that I had like the Facebook memories come up yeah. there. It was just a couple of days ago, or like just through the last few days is kind of the anniversary, I guess, of it all. Anyway, yeah. End of May. yeah. Yeah. So it's fitting that we have this podcast, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So a bit about myself, I guess, kind of a history of, of where I am. And I like to point out that I'm, I'm a work in progress. I'm not, I'm not exactly where I want to be in my field, but I'm certainly doing the right things and, and going the right direction. So. I'll kind of give you a bit of a background on my athletic and academic career and, and coaching career. So athletically, so I'm from Fredericton, New Brunswick. I grew up here. I played for, for the local sporting organization here at BSA, played for the province. So Team New Brunswick, basically from 14 to, to 17, 18. Um, I also played on the Canada Games team in 2013, um, where I was the starting fullback. To clarify, this is for soccer. <laughs> I haven't mentioned that. <laughs> and soccer is really is, is really a big part of my life and where all of my career and my, my goals are kind of revolving around. So kind of a common theme throughout. So after Canada Games, I went to, to UMB where I did the uh, bachelor's in, in kinesiology. Um, I also played soccer there for four years. Was lucky enough to be a part of a team that, that was quite successful. For the first two three years with a bronze medal and a silver medal at cis which is now uh, u sport afterwards i took a year and i worked the student gym at umb the, the high performance gym and also the urec student gym um, where i coached like anything from a judo athlete to a basketball player to a soccer player so like individual athletes team sport athletes basically just assisting the strength and conditioning coaches that were leading those spaces. One thing too, sorry to cut you off. Yeah, sorry. You, you skipped over to to keep pumping your tires there. You worked with the varsity program and regular people, but you also worked at, at that was the hub for the Canadian Sports Center Atlantic in New Brunswick at the time. So you got to work with several, if I remember correctly, national level, and international level athletes. Yeah, there were a few athletes in there that were like pretty high caliber for example like karate there's kate for karate there's different athletes that come through there but um yeah like uh, the umb gym is kind of a partnership between Kate sport center atlantic and, and umb so yeah i kind of had the experience to help out with those athletes and primarily helping out uh, ken morrison who's the lead there and then there's mark gifford who's kind of an assistant or i think he's also maybe a regional strength and conditioning coach for Kate sport center atlantic which uh I'll speak about this later a bit about like mentorship uh, being kind of an important part of a journey of a strength and conditioning coach. But for now, I'll just I'll just uh, keep going here onto to the academic journey here. In in 2018, I went to Spain, so I was looking to do um, a master's degree, so kind of gain some knowledge and some some practical experience. Um, and I came across this master's degree in Spain in, uh, in the region of Murcia with UCAM. And uh, this was a very uh, kind of intensive program for a year where um, I had eight courses. I 
had a practicum to do. I had an internship to do. I had a thesis to write um, all within a year. So in 2018, January, I left and I did that. And uh, it went really well for me. So I actually ended up kind of separate from the, the master's. I ended up making connections and going to a professional club in, in Helsinki, in Finland. Um, the club was HJK Helsinki, probably the best team in the Finnish league, which is the Vikas Liga. When I was there, they had won the league maybe five times in a row. So I was lucky enough to kind of be an assistant to the first team strength and condition coach. That was Anton Matt and Lowry and uh, the reserve and academy strength and conditioning coach, which was uh, Petri, I forget his last name, but, and um, yeah, so once again, just got to learn from people who were at a very high level and just observe and also, you know, apply the knowledge that I had been learning through the masters. Um, I was lucky enough, which is kind of funny because I got there and then Petri hurt his back as soon as I arrived so I actually ended up running a bunch of sessions for the reserve team traveling with them was a bit of a jack of all trades helping with the physio stuff helping with the warm-ups helping with the strength and conditioning sessions so that was like the perfect experience to really kind of dip my my whole foot in the water rather than my just my toe kind of thing <laughs> yeah then I ended up defending my master's and I, I came back to Canada and then I've done since then I've done all sorts of I'd say almost random stuff I worked for for Soccer New Brunswick as a performance coordinator for a bit back in the CSCA gym a bit I'd say now I've transitioned more into actual soccer coaching and then a bit of the strength and conditioning tied to that mostly because of the pandemic so I've kind of had to pivot there so I'm, I'm kind of taking the opportunity to for continued education getting my soccer licensing and kind of applying the sport specific stuff with the strength and conditioning. So yeah, that's where I'm at right now. I was going to say, even though it's not exactly what you studied, your, your theoretical knowledge in the, not just strength conditioning, but kind of the sports science world, as well as your knowledge through your various certifications and actual practical experience, I would think would transition very fluidly into the soccer coaching world and make you a really uh, strong asset. Yeah, so it's like, it's one of those things where like principles transfer over to different sports and like what you're doing in, in your session, right? So like when people think of strength, a lot of people think like barbell, heavy loads, but strength isn't necessarily that. It's just the ability to, to apply force. So that could be on a field. It could be shielding a ball or, or a 1v1 battle with an, another player. It could be expressing force like explosively, so jumping for a header, a sprint. All the principles transfer over, but just kind of in, there's different nuances there. So I've been kind of trying to take all those different principles and apply it to my athletes. And I'm also working with like a lot of youth, which is like a whole other world in itself, kind of just developing different motor competencies or movement competencies from a young age. So you end up doing like way more coaching. When I worked with like the pro athletes in Helsinki, um, I was more trying to think, like we were th trying to think more of like the methodology and like the periodization of like, how can we help them perform or get that 1%. Whereas with the youth, you need to coach everything basically. Some of them you need to teach them how to run, mobility, coordination, agility. Once players get to the pro level hopefully they've mastered that so it's kind of a different world which is kind of it's kind of fun honestly for for the summer to be working with them and it also kind of is a good path into my next academic endeavor which is uh, the PhD kind of a massive project in life probably three years in, in New Zealand with uh, the Auckland University of Technology which I'm going to start in September um, and that's going to be primarily oriented to uh, strength and power training with team sport athletes um, obviously, I have a bias towards soccer, <laughs> but uh, I think we're trying to keep it a bit more open to team sport athletes because uh, there's a lot of similarities between sports in that regard. So, yeah. Wow, that sounds like an amazing opportunity. Uh, it's funny because, you know, the phrase is, you know, it usually gets cut down to just strength coach, but really it's strength and conditioning coach. It's and that certification that, that a lot of people take is a certified strength and conditioning specialist, right? Kind of like what you said, when people think uh, strength, they think big heavy weights all the time. But like you said, strength is expressed in so many ways. Being stronger allows you to, like you said, express force in different directions in different ways. Ways allows you to express more force to get a get a stronger 
more efficient stride as you run, whether you're a track athlete, whether you're a soccer player, a football player, whatever, you know, more strength lets you run, more strength lets you decelerate quicker, change direction, mm -hmm. so you're more agile, right? So strength, while it is kind of that first word there, because it is the foundation, like the knowledge mm -hmm. goes far beyond just how to lift heavy weights, right? So obviously it transitions well, like you said, to coaching. Yeah, and it's, uh, and it's also interesting, like I have an under 13 group that are go into the CSCA gym. So there's a partnership between FDSA and the CSCA and UMB um, in the city. So like a couple times a week, we get the U13s in there. It's, for most of them, it's the first time they've ever been in a gym. And like a lot of it is, is movement to begin with. But, but later on, once they get into like 14, 15, 16, they'll start moving some heavier weights. And there's like a huge transfer from building maximal strength to like sprinting performance and things like that so it's like another thing that i always preach is like open-mindedness and, and like how you think about training because you'll have a lot of sport specific coach so like your coach like a let's say like a head coach of a team um, may think like all oh, these weights are making my players slower i don't want them doing this because they might get injured things like that but in reality the research shows that strength work is actually decreasing the risk of injury and may actually improve their their performance in like sprinting tasks and tasks that are extremely important for the sport. So there's always kind of like a happy medium between the two. So like I'm a huge advocate for like using those moderate to heavy loads, but like you have to make sure you periodize it so that you're not interfering with the actual sport because at the end of the day what we're trying to do is improve the athlete in their sport, right? So there's lots of nuances there and I guess with experience um, that's something that I'm learning and I'm, I'll probably always be learning for the next 20, 30 years or more is how to integrate that kind of a big challenge. And that's where also like going back to the mentorship is making sure like, so like I have a good relationship with, with American Ken at CSCA. I do research with my old supervisor in Spain. I still message some of my old classmates because uh, they're doing some cool stuff abroad as well, just to see like, okay, you're doing this at this time in the season. How's it going with your athletes and trying to apply different things to my athletes. And it's just like trying to have a good conversation and a good community so that you can learn as much as you can and apply it and help your athletes get better. That's so true. I mean, strength and conditioning is, is so many things like it's, it's a science, right? Like it's where, like you, you said the word periodization, like strength and conditioning is kind of really the uh the the truest kind of simplest purest form of it where it literally is like how do you get stronger it's progressive overload right you start with mm -hmm. a, a high volume at a low intensity or a low weight so you can build that kind of work capacity that muscular uh foundation that you then get strong kind of mm -hmm. hypertrophy the person then you move into that strength phase where you transition them the weights get a little heavier the volume comes down there's that volume intensity changeover and then followed by sort of the, the very end of it sort of the specific part strength sport that's just lifting a heavy weight but again that transitions to coaching so well because on that science side understanding those adaptations and how that those come into play at different times in the season obviously that transitions so well to sport coaching because you just apply the principles of periodization to the sport as opposed to in the weight room yeah and it's almost like a perfect comparison like it's at the start of a season you do a lot of volume so if you have a preseason, you do a lot of volume um, to build a base and then you go into more kind of speed power stuff and by the end of the season you're just doing mostly speed stuff like it's it's always a progression right yeah it's it's basically what you just said but like in, in just a little bit different training mode and yeah, it's really like it's, you can't be like stuck on on absolutes in, in the field because like I, I see a lot a lot of it in the field where like someone gets really stuck on like soccer players. They need to lift heavy all the time and da da da. And I, I think there's a transition away from that just with all the knowledge that's out there. But like, yeah, there's so much information out there. There's so many resources. To me, it's like a bit hard to get it wrong. Yeah. But like, for example, like I've been talking about soccer, but like you did many years at UMB as a wrestler. Uh, I did uh, soccer at UMB and we'd be in the gym sometimes at the same time. And like our workouts were dramatically different. Like you were doing a lot of heavy lifting and even your, your sport specific training would have been pretty heavy because you're dealing with some pretty heavy guys 
that you have to toss around, right? Not only move your own body, but you have to move someone else of equal size to you. Exactly. So there's like so many things to consider if you're going from sport to to sport. Like in a team sport, you have to think about how much you know mileage they're doing, how many accelerations, decelerations, sprints, and hops, and landing contacts. Like if you play rugby, um, you know there's contacts or football things like that same thing like so if you if you go looking at wrestling I imagine you were pretty banged up after a fight how many matches usually like in a regular tournament you could have anywhere from about three to six matches depending on how many people are in your bracket or in your or if it's a round robin how what the tournament kind of style is right how many matches you win or lose right you could have yeah. two, you could have six right but but on a, on a good day you're usually going to have a few more matches so you can be pretty banged up by the end of a, a competition weekend yeah so that's pretty like that's pretty rigorous that also like highlights the importance of the strength training too yeah because you want to be a robust athlete so that's another like there's a few things that some coaches have said like mentors have said that have stuck with me and one of them is from from Thomas Freitas who's he's a primarily into kind of basketball strength and conditioning he's a PhD and a lecturer at the university I went to there in Spain and he was big on building robust players so not necessarily like hypertrophy like big players or anything like that but just like robust players that were able to play in a tournament and not get injured and also travel and do all of those things without getting injured yeah, well, that's what resistance training does and proper periodization does is it not only improves your muscles expression of force, but it also improves their work capacity It improves the, like you said, kind of the rigorousness, right? Uh, the yeah. of the connective tissue of your tendons and ligaments and the cartilage around the joints, you have to stress that tissue to actually cause it to become stronger right and if you never stress it then it actually will regress it will degrade so again strength conditioning goes beyond just like you said lifting heavy weights all the time it's it's a it's an overall health thing too yeah and just like even like taking care of certain players with different issues throughout the season different interventions and with strength training can fix even like i listen to a bunch of podcasts as well on strength and conditioning you, um, there are certain pro clubs that use these sessions basically the load itself on the tissue is actually somewhat of like a stretch. You put that muscle and tendon under tension and then you get kind of like a nice stretch and you get the adaptations from keeping kind of the fascicles lengthened because people tend to get kind of shorter kind of muscle lengths and uh, fascicle lengths when they're detrained. Um, so the strength training kind of contributes to that, which is fantastic. Yeah, and then plus all the performance benefits that you get from it. Yeah, and I mean, uh, you've alluded to it so many times and kind of building on what I was saying earlier, but how many things strength conditioning is, it's also an art. Uh, kind of mm -hmm. like you said, beginning with just the difference between sports, right? If you're a strength coach, you got to take in wrestlers, soccer players, basketball players, football players, volleyball players, rugby players, right? Mm -hmm. And understand all these different sports, diff understand their different energy demands, their how they will generate fatigue, what their load on the body is. And then also within those sports, there's individual athletes. You said working with uh, younger athletes, working with injured athletes, working with different positions within a sport so it's it's an art when you take all these different variables in with one athlete or a team and you have to play around with every little variable on top of that working around other sessions right whether they have dry land sessions that are a little more sport specific uh whether they have a lot of games or a lot of practices uh you have to manage that load you have to manage that fatigue as well as manage what do they need what kind of adaptations are appropriate for their sport and then within that, like within what's appropriate for the sport, what kind of adaptations are appropriate for the specific athlete? Yeah, you hit the nail right on the head with that <laughs> one. <laughs> a lot of people like to use that analogy. Of yeah, well, like I'm primarily French, so sometimes I say I'll, I'll say them completely wrong. My so. favorite one, uh, the French to English, is saint cassette. It's like happy hour. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's five <laughs> but like no one would get that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like what what uh, what. You know, you want to go for five to seven? What? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then another thing, I mean, just, just again, strength conditioning is so many things. It's a living organism. You talked about earlier um, that you're always trying to keep up on the research and there's so much of it. And there's, there's really not a whole lot of wrong answers. 
it's kind of being in the strength conditioning research and staying up to date, it's kind of more so finding out what's the right answer on a given occasion, right? It's, it's you're given the set of variables, what's not only going to work, but what's going to work best based on their sport, their anatomy, their injury or medical history, their training history. And there's always new stuff coming out. There's always new research coming out. So there's always kind of more questions answered on what's a more efficient way to make this athlete stronger, faster, more durable, uh, better endurance, whatever, right? Yeah, it's just like it's within the context of whatever your situation is in the sport, right? Even from year to year, like most teams, like they'll, they'll have their seasons around the same time of the year, every year. They might have a completely different set of players, athletes, circumstances, you have COVID. Yeah, now, exactly. which is a, they're very <laughs> much a living organism. Yeah. So it's just like, yeah, it's like you said, it's like it's the science and an art of coaching, basically. And like, I'm probably stealing it from, from someone, but it's, it's basically <laughs> you, have, you have this 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 toolbox as a coach. So you try to fill it with, with as many tools as you can. Um, so kind of that knowledge and the practical experience. Uh, and then whenever the occasion comes within a context, you try to use the right tools. Um, that tool could be like a strength training intervention, it could be like eccentric training or blood flow restriction if you want to get fancy or you know olympic Olymp- olympic weight lifts uh could just be traditional strength training or a rehab program could be like a million and one things right um, I, I love that toolbox analogy but i remember the first time i heard it that's uh that's greg duquette from, is it uh, okay that's that's kin thousand one man <laughs> okay so that's yeah, so like subconsciously i have that in the back of my head for oh like yeah that was that 10 was, years ago i heard that a lot uh yeah but uh it's kind of cool yeah because like where you know it's always changing you're always given a different set of variables and it's interesting how kind of the research and the evidence permeates into the lay terms into the general population because thinking about years ago you saying that you have a group of u13s how it used to be thought of as it got into the general population oh strength training's bad it's gonna stunt growth it's gonna mm-hmm. and then i guess sort of the on the the medical scientific side of that it's more so the the, I guess when the growth plates are open, right? Those end plates. And that's where I guess kids at certain ages are vulnerable, but you dig in a little deeper through the research. And as long as you're educated, like a proper certified strength conditioning coach, just like someone with, with, you know, with a master's degree going into their PhD would have, it's like, oh, you just have to modify training variables at certain times in, in these kids' lives that just make sure that you're not causing damage but there's no reason you can't do strength training and it even shows there's so much positive benefits for bone health for expression of or or i guess release of a lot of important hormones like testosterone and growth hormone in human development for muscle development for like you said working with those kids it's it's a lot less you know big heavy weights all the time it's a lot more developing just fundamental movement skills because it's great if you've got this person who can in uh you know kick a ball well but if they can't squat low enough to really get down and get into a proper jumping motion or something then there are they really going to be a very well-rounded player right so you, you've got mm-hmm. to have that sort of knowledge and background but it's nice that you know you're talking about training kids training people in that u13 because it's so important in that uh, athletic and just physical development i think yeah and i think it's fitting i like i really like this podcast as being kind of maritime health and performance type of setting because we really are in a different world here in in the maritimes where we have smaller populations probably because of that proportionately we'll have less coaches so like it's really important that we expose like the younger youth to good coaches and like break through certain myths as well in strength and conditioning and uh it's great to see like the speakers on, on your podcast that have like different accreditation and you know bachelor's degrees, uh, master's degrees, and and so on. Because it's really important that that we expose the kids to the right um, information and the right types of training and the right environments. Kind of the biggest like things that I brought back with me, and that like in every conversation I had with like all of the different soccer coaches, either with Soccer New Brunswick or with locally here in Fredericton, was um, getting your most experienced coaches with the younger kids because that's what they did in Finland that's what they did in Spain you'll see uh, the guy coaching the under 15 or under 13 academy 
is your oldest coach at the club because he has the most experience and the most knowledge and he can apply that. Usually the, the guys that are with the first team and pro club is like kind of a, a go-getter, kind of a younger guy, basically. So it's kind of like, it's incredible. I love like, I love having like volunteers, but I like having a bit of a mixture between like, you know, kind of those parental volunteers and then like a really experienced coach um, that will kind of help guide them and, and everybody kind of learns in the process. So it's kind of like this like maritime situation where one, we need to kind of find those athletes because they're kind of scoured across different provinces and, and we kind of have these different hubs kind of bigger cities. So trying to get them together, get the best athletes together. Um, and then the next challenge is, is the coaching and, and having coaches who are educated, working with those best athletes. Yeah, well, it's it's so interesting that that is the method over in Europe where you're working. And it makes sense because if you have a kid who has the fundamentals down, if you have a 13, 14, 15 year old that you know is a good squat pattern, uh, can do a good lunging pattern, then they can do any sort of single or, or two leg variants of a lot of lifts. If they can move a medicine ball or maybe some bands, if they can push their body weight around, if they can sprint properly, if they know how to do a full jump they mm -hmm. can be taught a clean very easily, right? They can be taught a squat very easily, a deadlift very easily, a lot mm -hmm. of lifting patterns um, on the surface. To get really good at them, it's hard, mm -hmm. just like anything. But to learn the proficiency to, to the extent that I think an athlete needs to better themselves at their sport, I mm -hmm. think if they have a lot of those fundamental movement skills down from when they're younger, then it just makes the coaching when they are older, when they are ready for those bigger weights, mm -hmm. larger movement patterns, more technical movements within their sport and within strength conditioning. Um, if they have all those fundamentals down, then it's so much easier to coach them and when they're when they're physiologically ready for it to really uh create some really significant development and i guess that kind of speaks to the principles of long-term athlete development right and you see it i think in a lot of sports and it's north america it's that kind of compete 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 play as many games as possible a little less than let's develop them while that when they need that when it's really hard to learn these movement patterns so when it's mm -hmm. time to play game after game after game they're more than ready for it their their physiology makes it really easy transition to that yeah and it's it's, it's like those uh, like you said like those movement competencies and like the LTAD framework if you have a young athlete and you can just teach them those basic movement competencies and like this whole like debate between like early specialization and generalization is where the lines get blurred a little bit here but if you can develop those they can apply those different skills into different sports so if they do decide to specialize in a certain sport then they'll be able to excel so basically they're, they're, they're able to excel in, in any sport that they choose if at a young age they're taught these fundamental movement skills yeah i mean it's a good buzzword and you, you see it in, in a lot of textbooks or any sort of coursework when you're working with kind of developing child athletes or or just in general health for kids and adolescents in general that that's the point of it they want to develop those fundamental movement skills uh and, mm -hmm. and it is a really good buzzword because it really does highlight how important they are they're yeah. fundamental so just just so i don't keep you crazy long pack because i know you got plenty of coaching to do <laughs> yeah stuff. and i mean i think i could probably have you here all day yeah uh, i guess moving on to all these different places you get to go to um get the, getting to spend so much time there in spain for your masters in helsinki like you said and then as well as back here in in fredericton and through all your your reading and, and courses and whatnot through kind of a north american uh, training style has there been any big differences in not only the strength conditioning but also in the academia world where you've gotten to be a part of both in the in the actual team sport world um where you've been kind of at a high level of soccer and then getting to work with that pro club. Um, so a anything kind of that really stands out for you? Yeah. So it's, it's, that's like a, a really interesting topic. And I think the biggest thing I see just from like a science to a practitioner perspective is that there's like a bit of a disconnect or even like, like, you know, not all research is very applicable in the field. So I find often people in the field will look at research in a bad way because of that. But I think there is a transition towards this like kind of evidence-based practice and all of this and, and working within like interdisciplinary teams and all this, which is fantastic. But I think like also the, the other disconnect is just like misinterpretation. So I think 
in terms of researchers, we need to do a better job at communicating the actual results and the like the applications yeah. of our findings. And then as a practitioner, maybe looking at that more critically and trying to find maybe a better resource. You know, there are certain blogs that I love because they have some really good practitioners, but some blogs that are maybe not the best place to get your information from. <laughs> Um, so trying to sift through that. And then in terms of like the style, like in Europe, I honestly saw a little bit more of an open-minded approach to training where they were a bit less afraid to try things that may seem a bit silly <laughs> <laughs> that were supposedly effective. Whereas in Canada and in the U.S., I think we in Canada, we have a very similar kind of approach to the U.S. and our strength and conditioning where with kind of the National Strength and Conditioning Association and the guidelines that are given out for that. It's it's very like, it's it's somewhat traditional strength and conditioning um, in my eyes. So like, from my perspective, I try to take a little bit from both. And that's why I urge like at the start of the podcast, I say like open-mindedness and having your toolbox and experimenting and things like that. Like, um, I think that's that's something that, that coaches here in, in the Maritimes could benefit from as well. Even in Europe, they could probably benefit from certain uh, trainers could benefit from just focusing on fundamentals as well um, rather than doing the fancy stuff so I don't I'm not really sure if I answered your question there but <laughs> no no it's I guess I should have I could have phrased it better I, I didn't really want need a difference like uh yeah the other just kind of a, a, a comparison I guess or kind of a yeah. things done differently because we kind of talked about earlier there's a lot of right answers just some are yeah. more right under different scenarios um and i think that open-mindedness is really important and you said the word earlier guidelines as far as interpreting research goes and, and i think it's really important to have both that real world experience and the research because the research gives you results based on a very specific very controlled condition mm -hmm. on a, a sample of people that best as they can are meant to represent a greater number of people, but a lot of the times, uh, the results, while we want it to be generalizable, might be very specific to that population, right? Based on a, a mm -hmm. study that you, Pat Cormier, might do later and later on, like your results might say that this this kind of version of strength training is better than this version to increase speed in male soccer players from the age of 19 to 25 in maybe more appropriate rugby players, if this is a stuff in New Zealand or something, yeah. um, from the age of 19 to 25, right? At this program with these similar backgrounds through kind of the say it was would be the New Zealand sports system right so it ends up being quite a specific set of results even though we'd like it to be generalizable and that's why there really has to be so much research done using maybe a similar or single methodology on a large group or a lot of different groups um, time mm -hmm. and time again but um, the point I was trying to make is you take those results being in from the academia world and then that kind of is where strength conditioning transitions from the science to the, the art, right? You take these results, mm -hmm. use it as your, your guidelines, like you said, um, mm -hmm. and then apply it in your situation, apply it with the, the kind of one of the most important principles, the principle of specificity to mm -hmm. the team you're working with, to your client, to the age group you're working with, right? So there's, there's a lot more than just reading papers and saying, Dr. So-and-so did this, so I have to do this. It's saying, hey, these guys did this, so this might be a good method, but I have a team of 14-year-old junior high, high school basketball players, and this study was done increasing jumps in uh, NCAA D1 volleyball players. So a foundation of what they did might work for my team, but I might have to adapt it based on any number of variables, right? So then you take that science and really it becomes an art having to pair these together, having the, the confidence and the self-efficacy to sort of make that decision to say, I'm going to change this a bit and, and see if that works, right? You got to bet on yourself and see if it mm -hmm. works. And, if it, and that's kind of the other thing too, strength conditioning, like I uh, also said, living organism. It takes time mm -hmm. to find out the best kind of variables right the best training load the best exercises who responds best to what right it takes a while um so i mean it really is complex but it's really fun the kind of stuff you get to do and it's and it's amazing that you're coming in with an open mind and also being open to not having you know kind of an ego to to read more and learn more and having that open mind to say okay based on all these new trends, I might be wrong about this, or I might not be exactly right. There might be more to this than I realize. So having that 
academia background, having that athletic background, having that strength conditioning background, all paired with that trying to learn and be open-minded, I think is so important for not just you, but like any strength conditioning professional, especially around here that we can just constantly be learning and, and developing the field. Yeah. And it's really important to just like have the conversations. Like, like I learn from coaches here that have no um, education in terms of sports science. I'll have a conversation at the field with, with a soccer coach that might teach me something. Right. So it's just like really building that community, your local community. And, and now with social media, you can reach out to basically anyone. Yeah. Um, and especially in the Maritimes where, like I said, we're a small population, you know, we don't have as many like pro teams. We do have some excellent athletes out here, but it's like the high performance is a, a small group of people, right? So you got to think a little bit about if I want to be in high performance, I'm also going to have to coach probably all types of people at some point um, to gain that experience to get to that high performance, right? So it's like over the years, like I said, I did some high performance, but I also did like some personal training, conversation with personal trainers, with sports specific coaches, with just always trying to be open minded and have those conversations. And that'll take you in the right direction kind of thing. Well, I mean, it's so important to work with a wide variety of people. Uh, just one, you're going to find out maybe what sort of population that you might really enjoy the most, right? And that's sort of uh, and another important thing we could talk about probably all day too, just enjoyment of what you're doing. But um, so you find out maybe where you're good at, where your niche is. Um, mm -hmm. But as well, you find all these transferable skills. If you work with... Uh, soccer there's probably some transferable energy systems to rugby to hockey mm -hmm. to even to basketball right like um a lot of those kind of intermittent burst sports mm -hmm. uh if you know you're familiar with wrestling and training and finding out what works with them you can transfer that to judo you can transfer that to certain football positions to certain aspects of rugby training right like and like you said you'll you'll take advice from just soccer coaches right there's something we said about just experience right and just trial and error finding what works right you can do as much research as you want but it might be just night and day versus when you get like you said in the field when you get with a mm -hmm. different age group different sport different sporting culture and all that sort of different variables variables play into what's going to work and what's not as far as programming and trying to generate sort of the best athlete best team possible yeah exactly at the end of the day you have to enjoy it and enjoy being with your athletes right oh yeah you gotta so. you gotta you gotta enjoy it you gotta love it um so i guess sort of a little topical in current times i, I think new brunswick's a little uh a little more opened up, but Nova Scotia is pretty locked down here for another uh, week or two. What has it been like being a strength coach, being a researcher, being a soccer coach during the global pandemic, trying to get all your work done and trying to keep, you know, coaching your athletes, trying to keep up on research, trying to do your own thing? Because it's quite a hill to climb. Yeah, I think for a lot of people, it was a bit of like a reset, like in New Brunswick or most of Canada, we went into lockdown a year ago and at the time, like all gyms were closed for a while, basically to last summer, I didn't do any coaching whatsoever. I really just try to read and keep learning. I'm, I'm always kind of writing and, and researching with some different projects. So it's so obviously being at home kind of just gave me plenty of time to, to work on that. But um, in terms of coaching, I just kind of had to take a, a break, which I feel like a lot of people had to do around the province. Um, but once things opened up a bit, the gym I work out opened up in the summer, there were still no opportunities to train for a bit. So then I kind of pivoted a little bit with with the, the soccer training, right? So I went back to my roots a bit, tried to get back into to coaching soccer and growing in that field, get my licenses, kind of pair that sport specific knowledge with the strength and conditioning. And I did a bit of online training for a bit because in last winter we were kind of on and off of these one or two week lockdowns. So I had a few clients online to keep with my strength and conditioning coaching. So yeah, it's kind of, I'd say like the pandemic is has affected the strength and conditioning for me like quite a bit you know before then I was more like in the gym working uh, more so with athletes weekly now I'm more on the the kind of sport specific coaching um, and I figure a lot of coaches had to kind of pivot and find different ways to one make a living and and the other is just trying to find out what's something that's thriving here during the pandemic. Like we're lucky enough here in New Brunswick that we can play soccer and, you know, in other provinces, they're not able to play at all. They're not able to train. So it, it's really dependent on, on the person. But I think that the pandemic has been a bit of like a reset 
figure out what's the next step. So I kind of ident- identified that, that the PhD was the next step in my development, in my career, since basically it was accepted just before the pandemic started. So it gave me a lot of time to kind of start planning those projects. So yeah, I think just the important thing was just trying to always develop the whole time during that pandemic. Or I guess we're still in the pandemic. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. one of my favorite sayings is you got to make a chicken salad out of chicken shit. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm right on board with you. This gave me so much time, all the different shutdowns and stuff to read and to further educate myself. It's given me time to study and get my CSCS Mm -hmm. uh, to finish up my master's. I've plugged through more books in the last several months since, you know, or I guess year now since uh, the shutdown uh, than I have in in probably the five years prior. It's been great for, for that kind of thing. And Mm -hmm. yeah, like trying to, having to make the best out of a bad situation, training clients Mm -hmm. online, making yourself available to different sports, uh, open to different experiences and which really are just different opportunities to hone your craft, whether it's through, through reading and doing research or whether it's through working with different age groups, different sports, different Mm -hmm. areas of training, whether it be strength conditioning or actually on the field sports specific, you know, there's so many different things that people have been able to make a, a good thing out of a bad situation. Um, And I mean, we have been lucky in the Maritimes, like you said, there's been times you've been opened up as well. I mean, just up till March or April here, things like the judo club I was going to, they weren't operating at 100% just to keep bodies at a a good number, but they were allowed to. And like a lot of sports were allowed to go ahead. People were allowed Mm -hmm. to play games, right? With even some some bit of fans or or no fans, but at least full games. Um, Mm -hmm and train together gyms were the gym i was going to the y there in halifax was wide open like there wasn't even Mm -hmm. a check-in time right like there was just they weren't hitting that capacity that they were uh, allowed to operate with and again very safely operate within that capacity but they weren't hitting that because we were allowed to be you know pretty well normal for a while just wearing masks and stuff but so we've been Mm -hmm. pretty lucky but uh but yeah it's definitely been a a challenge definitely for a lot of people but it's amazing to hear that you've made such a again a chicken salad and a chicken poo (laughs) (laughs) um one thing pat like you kind of mentioned sort of and we got talking about sort of weight lifting for kids different perceptions wrong perceptions of what strength conditioning might be are there any big myths you'd like busts out there you know thinking back to like you know kids should oh god weight weight training will make you bulky knees shouldn't go beyond your toes any any myths you want to bust in the snc and training world <laughs> honestly there are so many i think you've even posted on this kind of stuff with the whole notion around fatigue and lactic acid and all oh, that, that that's kind of, said, yeah my instagram is uh, exactly that popular people might have missed it <laughs> yeah so just like i'm not gonna dive into it like deep into it, but it's it's metabolic acidosis is the correct term to use because there's more than just uh, lactate involved in, in muscle metabolism. And there's a balance between ions from different substrates and from potassium, sodium, go on and on. There's an ionic balance basically. And when, once you get an accumulation of, of cations in the blood, the pH reduces, which creates a acidic environment where the buffering of O2 and CO2 isn't done efficiently, hence the fatigue. I guess if you can also tag on to that, the soreness you feel the next day is also not lactic acid. That's more so an indicator of muscle damage. Yeah, so those are kind of the two big ones that I hear all the time that that I'm not a big fan of. Yeah, um, that, that lactic acid, lactate one's a, a popular misconception where, you know, like you said, it is uh, when that acidic environment occurs, muscle contraction can't occur as easily. There's yeah. all a, there's just a, a, an, a, not an associated, a paired response where we see more lactic acid because the, like you said, oxygen cannot take that and clear the hydrogen, clear the acidic elements out of our blood, use that mm-hmm. lactate as energy, right? Um, yeah. so that increase because that it's just kind of correlated, not, not causing, right? Um, yeah. And like you said, it's the deletion of substrate substrates. It's that creating an acidic, acidic environment that really makes that fatigue onset. You can't contract your muscles as well. You don't contract them as coordinated as before, right? So I mean, there's there's a lot more to it. And, and like you said, that is a very common misconception. Yeah, and there's evidence showing that even lactate is used elsewhere in the body. Your brain oh, uses I know. it. There's some your stuff. Your I think heart, years. right? So. So it's not, you know, let's not try to cut out 
lactate from the <laughs> no exactly the sister yeah. interesting research that showing that it could even be an energy source so i'll just leave you with that with the uh, <laughs> with the because uh, that's the one that really like the guy the guys at work like to poke fun at me talking yeah. about lactic acid so we'll just leave it at that <laughs> sounds good that's my that's my trigger word <laughs> Uh, glad to hear it. Someone's got to yeah. be delivering the 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 good word of uh, of of the science of of exercise. Exactly, and who knows? Maybe these things get proven and disproved all the time. Oh, I know, and you like know, you said, so, that's where that open mindedness comes in. Yeah, yeah. So we may be wrong. Who knows? In ten years. So as of right now, I'll take the evidence that we have. Exactly. That's all you can do. Yeah. Pat, before we finish up, uh, is there anything that you want to plug? Any programs? Any, any, are you taking clients? Are you looking for any athletes? Anything like that you want to plug? Any research participants? Can't really do any research on participants. Um, mostly like searching literature because of the pandemic world that we're in right now and the fact that I'm not in New Zealand right now too. <laughs> and I imagine most of the people listening right now um, are probably not in New Zealand. Hopefully in the future, they, your viewer base might be might be wider right? <laughs> some um, we'll get that get that spotify money <laughs> yeah yeah so yeah so yeah i just like i would, I would just urge people to, to share matt's uh matt's podcast i really like what he's doing um in terms of if you want to to follow give me a follow on on instagram let me see what's my instagram handle and if you're interested if you're an athlete interested for training you can reach out to me it's uh, P Cormier underscore on, uh, on Instagram. Um, you can send me a message, DM me, whatever. I'm, I'm always happy to have a conversation with anyone about any topic. So always happy to make connections in the province and in the Maritimes. So just don't hesitate to, to reach out. Awesome. Well, thanks, Pat, for the, uh, the plug on the show, about the show, some plugception. And yeah. area, there you go. Pat left his contact. We'll obviously tag him the show post. We'll tag him in all the uh, the descriptions and stuff. So you'll he'll be easy to find if you're interested in chatting with him or anything like that. So Pat, uh, thank you so much for volunteering your time. And uh, that's all we got for today on Maritime Health and Performance Chat. All right, cheers. Thanks, Matt.